Okay, everybody, welcome to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by North Coast. It's Wednesday, October 27th, 2021, and it's Justin Nielsen here along with my partner in crime, Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. Uh, welcome back, Arusha. Hey, it's great to be back. Justin, as, <laughs> as every you are week, every, week. every week. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, can That's we really say at this point, you know, welcome back, or is it just like, hey, yeah. thanks for showing up, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So, Arush and I are going to take some wee time today and uh, talk a little bit about this market and uh, a few stocks. And, you know, using that market, uh, I guess, feedback to kind of guide you in how you approach things. Um, you know, more than anything, I think it's still important to make sure you're keeping those losses small. Um, but we'll talk about how we're adjusting our portfolios in terms of uh, taking those profits when we have them. Uh, so we'll talk about the markets. We'll talk about that uh, kind of investing lesson. And then as always, we'll talk about a few stocks. So let's get right into it. Maybe we start with the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ composite uh, has logged in a couple distribution days uh, com coming out of this rally here, this nascent rally. And now that we're getting to new highs, it's struggling a little bit to, to get into new high territory. What's your take here, Arusha? Yeah, I, it We'll have to see. I think you first have to assume it's par for the course, where you have a rally, it's a, a few week rally, and then you pull back and, and stocks come in hard and it's very easy to get shaken out. So until that truly changes, and until we're, stocks have proven that and the markets have proven that we're back in, a, in an environment where we're back in a, a trending environment, Right. You have to assume that it's kind of this chop and slop type, type of market. So the market always does enough, or it has this year, it's done enough to give you confidence after a couple of weeks. You maybe have a fall through day, maybe the number of stocks really start working well. But once you get into that third or fourth week, and it looks like we'll, we'll have to see how it ends, but we have that distribution day on the NASDAQ on October 22nd. And then we had that stalling day yesterday on October 26th and had that stalling day right near all time highs right. on the NASDAQ. So that was the one thing I was watching because if you go back and look how the NASDAQ behaved back in April when we approached new highs and actually got into new highs, we started a correct sell off and, and came back and fell below the 50 day moving average. Shook out a lot of people, probably had to put it back under pressure by following our rules, mm -hmm. right? And then, then the market kind of does that little shake off, 5% pullback. Now everyone gets scared, me included. Then the market comes back up, up back up to the above the 50 a, a day again, quiets down, and then it's able to rally um, and, and um, really frustrate a lot of people. Like it's frustrated. Uh, a lot of people, me included, again, um, if you're buying breakouts and if you're if you're trying to follow kind of the traditional O'Neill strategy. Yeah, it certainly still feels like the pullbacks has been where it's at. Again, when we say pullbacks, we're not talking about those really beaten down stocks necessarily, the stocks that are trading below their 200 day moving average lines and, you know, uh, in major downtrends, but more the stocks that have been, you know, overall trending up, but are, are pulling back maybe to their 50 day moving average line or what have you. So, uh, and, and when you say trending, it's again, it still feels like to me, there's a lot of these very short term trends where sometimes you're getting, oh, look, you know, oil and, you know, uh, stocks are up for a little while and the trend lasts about three days and then they kind of roll over. And, and uh, so again, that's where breakouts become really uh, tough to manage because you'll, you'll kind of, as soon as they come up to that level where you think, okay, yeah, this is, this is where you would expect the breakout. Uh, they, they, they kind of pull back in for a little while. Um, so that's, that's certainly been making it tough, but maybe we go back and, you know, define stalling real quick, because that's a term maybe not everyone is familiar with. And you mentioned how uh, Tuesday's action, uh, I mean, this was really kind of classic stalling action. Um, what you got was the NASDAQ composite was up, you know, what was it? I think a percent, uh, yeah, a, a, well, a full percent at the, mm -hmm. you know, at the high, um, it went negative for a little bit during the day, um, but then it closed up just 0.06%. And look at that volume 
beneath, you know, a huge yeah. amount of volume came in, um, you know, a couple, couple days before on Friday, we had that big volume day um, distribution that was that was coming in. And again, distribution is just when you have heavy volume um, and a price drop of 0.2% or more, suggesting that there's some institutional selling in there, which again, one day is not going to kill a, a rally. You know, two days isn't going to kill a rally. But when you start getting a cluster, when you start getting, you know, day after day, and really, if you look at that uh, top that we had at the beginning of September, um, you know, 14, you know, I mean, 15,403, uh, there was a lot of stalling in there where you were trying to make progress. Um, you were closing in the lower part of the range, like we did on Tuesday. Um, you, you were closing with not much progress being made, volume coming in heavier. Um, all of those, all of those points are kind of your classic stalling uh, action. Now, one thing I will say about the August and September stalling is that those were fairly tight spreads uh, between the high and the low of the, you know, so, so you're really kind of getting this tight action. And so that's, that's tough. You know, we had gone quite a ways. You were tightening up. I certainly could have seen it going up from there. Like, oh, this tight action could give you more setups. But then you also got to look at it as, look, this could be that it's stalling action where it's, you know, you're not getting the buying in there anymore, that, you know, you're getting selling into this. Um, so. I guess, you know, the context matters here, uh, that the fact that we had come up a little bit, and then if you see the distribution start accompanying that stalling action, I think that's what really tells you, hey, this is, this is something that might be getting into trouble. Yeah, it's interesting that you know, uh, in, in that early September, that, that you were calling those, or the team was calling those uh, stalling days, because I wouldn't necessarily have thought of those as stalling days, Yesterday was more kind of the yes. classic stalling day. Where it's funny you, you say that. Because, up and then, yeah. and then, yeah, yeah. You, you don't, you don't make any progress. It, it's, it's funny you say that because Chris, um, and you know, when we were having a, a discussion um, online about yesterday's action, he's like, finally a stalling day that looks like stalling. Yes. You know, yes. um, and, and again, what really made it not look like stalling was that those those days were so tight. You know, mm. and so again, oh, you closed in the lower part of the range. Well, if you didn't have much range, you know, that's not really saying much, uh, you know, when, when there's, there's not much of a spread between the high and the low. So uh, now, now, Justin, you, you mentioned something earlier just about the NASDAQ, the participation. Uh, we had Mark Minervini on IBD Live this morning, and he brought up a stat that he's, he's been watching very closely for a while, as a lot of others have too. Uh, it, it's kind of just how, how many stocks within the NASDAQ are above the 200 day moving average. And I think he said 36 or 38%, only 30, say, let's say 38%, only 38% of the NASDAQ stocks are above the 200 day moving average, which is telling you that there are, well, essentially 62% of the stocks within the NASDAQ have been going through essentially corrections or even bear markets. And so it's, it's hard for the larger markets or the environment to do well when you're not having enough participation and you're not having a broadening of the rally. And so there was a little bit of hope that maybe the markets or the participation uh, is starting to broaden a, a week ago or so. But maybe that's not the case now when you're starting to get the stalling, when you're starting to see some stocks that were doing well. And maybe you're just still in this environment where you have a little bit of rallies, you still have this rotation, as you mentioned, Justin, from oil to tech to oil to tech, you know, every every month, it's like a new flavor or whatever. Materials. You know, yes, materials stocks, or the, builders. Right, yeah. So yeah, it's like, uh, so I think you have to assume that's the environment once again, until proven otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, I was saying earlier on IBD Live this week that um, it, it did feel like things were starting to row in the you know, everything was rowing in the right direction, you know, together. Uh, Cause again, you look at what the NASDAQ did from mid February to June, where it was going flat. Meanwhile, the S and P 500 um, during that same time period was making new highs. You know, mm -hmm. it was, it was this nice uptrend. So it, it just looked very different. Um, so, you know, with this follow through day that we had, it seemed like, Oh, you know, 
the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's, that's making new highs. The S&P 500 is making new highs. The NASDAQ looks on its way. It's, it's looking strong. Um, and I was looking, because um, we, we have an internal thing that we use, um, I was looking and I was noting that, hey, uh, we were getting to 60% of the stocks being above their 50-day moving average line, 55% um, being above the 200-day. So we were moving in the right direction. Well, on the know. on the NICE or gold? No, no, this is overall. On the, you overall, know, the overall market. market okay, you know, wow. so, okay. um, so again, that's why I was feeling a little bit more positive. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. After the last couple of days, it's starting to feel like, okay, you, you look at Google, you know, Microsoft, uh, they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting again, yep. it seems like. Um, and now Tesla, the newest yep. member to the trillion dollar club, yep. um, you know, that's, that's certainly helping, uh, you know, with, with the indexes uh, showing a little bit more power. Um, you know, and we were looking at today, even though the day was positive, um, at one point when we were looking at it, uh, the the number of losers was well over double the number of uh, advancers, you know, for the day. Um, so uh, again, it's it's not as broad as maybe it was seeming like it might be. Well, and and so there's a couple of things. Well, first, I I I tried Google today just to say, okay, can I get this breakout to work out their earnings? Oh, I was so like, I you do... tried Google for the first time, the search engine. Like, where have you been? Like, <laughs> I, I mean, that, you that, that would stock. that, that would, I, I I would be very very unique if that was the case. Right. Um, so I bought Google. I do own uh, Tesla too, mm-hmm. uh, but what this is saying is for these stats that we looked at with the advanced decline line, with how the the S&P and the Dow are acting versus the NASDAQ is try to have more stocks. If you're going to have exposure in the market, and I think you should have more stocks that are part of the S&P and the Dow versus the NASDAQ. Um, and, and that's what I've tried to do this time around is I made a conscious effort because usually I'm much more tech related. Oh, yeah. That, you know, that, that those are those are our kind of stocks, right? right. Game changing uh, disruptors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so most of them are in the NASDAQ. So usually I'm always, always about that. But this time around, just by seeing how these stocks have behaved, I made a conscious effort to have certain percentage only in those kind of tech related disruptors. And then the rest more in kind of the energy or kind of builder kind of related uh, agricultural good commodity related stocks <laughs> that are actually near the top of the industry group rankings right and try to spread it out there and really listen to the market instead of just doing what I normally do by just going towards the disruptors yeah going going to what you're familiar with and yep. your, your usual uh, suspects so uh, to that end uh, when we come back we're going to talk a little bit more about using that market feedback to make better decisions with your investing stay tuned to help alleviate some of the pain that comes from bear markets We recommend investing 20 to 25% of the equity portion of your portfolio in a tactical strategy. If you are especially risk averse, we recommend a higher percentage. In 2008, the market declined 37%, yet our portfolio was only down 12%. Why? Because the conditions for investing were poor, so we held a lot of cash. Visit northcoastam.com slash tactical. All investments involve risk, including loss of some or all of an investment. may not be suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by North Coast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with my buddy, Arusha Paris. Uh, So Arusha, we were talking about, you know, some of the ways in which uh, you maybe have to not not go with what's so familiar, uh, you know, especially for us that are really kind of focused on the growth, the tech names, um, but really using that market feedback to maybe make adjustments. So let's talk a little bit about this kind of broadening out to some of the commodity plays, some of the cyclical plays. I mean, this is something that's been working really, uh, I would say, since since the election, the presidential election in November of 2020, um, you know, you certainly had vaccine day on November 9th that kind of uh, also was a catalyst to a lot of these these moves. But um, we've been seeing energy, we've been seeing, you know, home builders and, you know, solar stocks and uh, steel stocks, all of these kind of, um, you know, 
not necessarily the high the high growth names that we're used to um, kind of coming on. So where have you been focusing? Um, how much have you been spreading yourself out into different groups? And how much weight are you putting on those top groups and the 197 industry groups on MarketSmith? Well, yeah, well, it, essentially for me, a lot of it is, uh, I would say probably like 50-50. Okay. Where, so uh, it, it might be a little bit, probably it might be more 60-40, mm -hmm. more towards kind of the, the reopen plays versus uh, kind of the, the usual ones I like to go to with the disruptors and stuff like that. Now, the one group and you know which, which I, I i'm an idiot for but uh it, it was just hard to bring myself to buy them again it, initially were, were the, the energy stocks yeah. right so like i was looking at clr a, a number of times there and it was holding up really well while and this was back in you know back in early september uh, where it was setting up perfectly. And, and I was going to, there were a few times where I was just going to buy it. And so let me just get some exposure energy, especially because CLR was near highs. And meanwhile, the XLEs were near lows, right? So it was showing strength within it. Right. And especially once the XLEs started getting back above 50. But I, I, I hesitated once again, because I just didn't have the conviction. Mm -hmm. and, and even though CLR is probably one of the better uh, companies within this group. Uh, and so I just watched it go up again without me, but you, you, you can see it's almost like clockwork. This, this, this stock broke out past 40, ran up a little bit past the, the 20% mark. That's probably like 30 something percent here. And now it's starting to come back in again, right? Just when, so anyone who was in energy and if I was in it, I'd probably still be holding it. Oh, this is going to be, make a really big move. And now here it comes back in. It's starting to break the 21 day. Let's see how it behaves here. But the odds are starting to increase that it might make another visit back to the 50 day, almost in the same kind of way it acted uh, back in May, where it broke out of the base, ran up a bunch, got got almost a 30% gain, started breaking the, the 21 day, broke the 50, takes a couple of months off and sets up again. So it's working exactly the way it worked a few months ago, meaning that this rotation could still be going on. And, and once again, you have to assume that the environment's going to a more rotational environment until proven otherwise. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that you bring up, here's a breakout that works, right? You know, and, and does all of the things that we would expect our growth names to do, you know, acts in uh, complete character for that, but it, it's a, it's an oil stock. And, you know, certainly the U.S. explorers and producers, um, you know, just uh, people should maybe look at how this is group number two out of 197. And it has been one of the better groups for a while, especially because, as you noted, when this was getting to new high ground, and I, I, I kept on joking that it seemed like anything with resources in, it, in its name was, yes. you know, doing very well. So uh, you yeah. had AR, yep. uh, Antero Resources. Which RRC, is holding up incredibly well. So you know, that's still above the, the 21 day. Right. And what was interesting about these, a lot of these stocks, you know, these ones that were the first ones to new highs in that group, in the U.S. Explorer and Producer Group, um, the first ones to new highs, the market was rolling over they were continuing to new highs. So their relative strength lines, of course, were just getting stronger and stronger. The group was just moving up higher and higher. Um, and so it really had you know, everything going, going for it. Now, by contrast, you had a stock like Denberry, D-E-N, which you know, I was waiting for this thing to set up. And all of a sudden, uh, was this the one that uh, David Ryan this called? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Porcupine, uh, yeah. You know, where it was just, you know, all of these attempts that would that would fail. So certainly, even in this group, they aren't all created equal. And, you know, Denberry, look, it had a phenomenal move uh, from November uh, through through yeah. May and June. Um, but it just couldn't seem to, to to do it this time around. So you really have to uh, find the leaders and and what is your best way of, okay, you've got a group, U.S. explorers and producers, you identify that this is the group. How do you identify which one are you going to be pulling the trigger on? Well, it's a couple of things. Either you can look at the relative strength line mm -hmm. and see, okay, is that near all-time highs, near a 52-week high? The, the other way to do it is just sort the whole list by percent off high. 
which ones are right near new highs. So, uh, so if we go back to uh, continental resources, CLR, once on, on, what is this, on September 13th, it was breaking out of base and it, this was really good action. Right, right. It tried to almost get a new highs a week before, pulled back right to the 21 day, then finally made all time highs broke out of the consolidation on September 13th. Meanwhile, if I go back to Denbury, what was Denbury doing on September 13th? It was it was just kind of caught in this mess and still probably eight, nine percent off its highs while CLR was hitting new highs right, and breaking out of the base powerfully and really not waiting around. Those who hesitated, like me, when I was hesitating on CLR, it just took off. I was like, "Oh man, I missed it." Then guess what? I guess what? I tried one time when I was uh, was trying to go. It was Denbury, right? Because that was the one that was still hanging around. And then right. I was like, "Okay, this is clearly the laggard." So I so I was like, "I can't keep trying this one um, because I'm I'm trying the laggard." When meanwhile, CLR and and AR and uh, what Devon Energy mm -hmm. uh, just took off and just left you behind, right? The, the best stocks, and, and this is usually with growth stocks, but when stocks are in demand, a lot of times they give you one chance to get into them and then they're gone, right? right? And, and if, you, if you miss out on it, you're, you're gonna, you could be waiting a while. Um, the other kind of rule of thumb, and this is, this is a David Ryan uh, uh, thing that he, he talked about years ago is you know, his best stocks a lot of times when he bought them he usually finished that day and he was making money he's already up on that position mm -hmm. right so so those are a couple of indications of that you could be in one of the better stocks well and there again that's kind of going back to that whole idea of the market feedback right uh, the market's telling you immediately hey you're right on this decision and you know if you if you start with a smaller position with the idea of pyramiding into it uh, that's that's kind of how you do it. You use that market feedback to tell you, oh, you know what? I can dole my, more money out into this name or to the market and, you know, as a whole, if you have the follow through day happen. And in, in this case, I mean, we were talking with Scott St. Clair uh, last week about how there were so many of these, I, I'm sorry, the week before about how there were so many of these stocks that were setting up before the follow through day, mm -hmm. kind of pulling you in and, then they were working, you know, they were, they were making progress. So it was one of those things where it just seemed logical. Okay. Yeah. I can put some more money out there because everything that I'm doing is, is working so far, or at least the majority. Um, so again, that, that, that feedback mechanism now, just, just, well, just, a, just very quickly yeah. going off of that feedback mechanism, your portfolio in the end is going to be the one that's going to tell you whether your you're card, in the right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> every day, every minute, it's going to be telling you, right? Um, but it's going to be telling you whether you're making the right decisions or not. So on September 28th, and if you're watching on the videos, or if you're listening to this, you can always go to investors.com slash podcast and watch the video version. But I just switched the marketing charts um, to how it looked on September 28th. And so this is when the NASDAQ, uh, this was the second hit the NASDAQ took. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had the first hit on uh, what, what is that? September 18th or something like that around there uh, crawled yeah. back up on lower volume. And then you got that next big hit. Uh, and so this is September 28th. So naturally number of the NASDAQ stocks got hit hard, but let me, let me let's take a look at how CLR was looking on that day. CLR was already up 15% from its base and it was only down 0.85% mm -hmm. that day. Versus the NASDAQ was, let's see how much the NASDAQ was down. NASDAQ was down almost 3% that day. CLR was on, only down not even a percent. Or AR was down, well, AR got hit a little bit, but it was already up 30%. So the stocks that uh, you, you already, if you were in the right stocks, and in this case, the oil and gas stocks or the more kind of the reopen type of plays, you were giving back profits. You weren't, uh, you were already up quite a bit. And so that day was not that bad for you mm -hmm. versus if you were in more of the technology related stocks, that September 28th day was pretty bad for you, right? So that the report card there was telling you clearly, are you in the right stocks or not pretty decisively um, on that day?
Well, and to that point, you know, this is why we keep on kind of saying it's it's a little bit of this stock pickers market. You know, we, we might all be looking at the same stocks, but depending on what you kind of put your money into, you could have wildly different results because, uh, again, because of that breadth issue, because of that sector rotation that's going on, um, it's it, you're having very different results if you were uh, in the index, you know, the NASDAQ index itself, um, where a lot of the big, you know, Google and Microsoft and those were actually pulling back at that time, as opposed to some of these leading uh, U.S. Uh, gas and oil and gas explorers and producers. Um, so again, the, the, the patterns were still there. You know, you were, you were still using the same kind of uh, pattern recognition and everything, the relative strength lines, all of those different factors were coming in, but you were having wildly different results based on, you know, were you in these oil names at that time or were you in the other things? And I mean, personally, I was looking at the indexes thinking, man, this, this could go lower. And it did yeah. for a little while, um, but then it started rebounding and we started seeing, again, this buy on the dip mentality come in uh, strong once again, as, as it seems to have done uh, multiple times in the last uh, year and a half here, almost two years, um, where, you know, since, since the coronavirus crash, it just doesn't seem like the market's uh, willing to stay down for very long. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, and this, that that's kind of been going on for years. It seems like it's when you're down six, 7% off the highs, when the indexes are down that much, uh, now you want to start building up your watch list and make, make sure what stocks or what industry groups are leaders, uh, because you could get that follow through day, or you could start seeing the market turn uh, pretty quickly because you have this almost magical floor a lot of times. Uh, so, so this was, that was once again, like clockwork. It found it where it was looking pretty bad for a little while, uh, where it looked like we could break wide open to the downside, but we apparently live in a world these days where there are no more corrections. So, right. um, so and actually we're back right at new highs uh, and uh, that, that, that's, that's the environment we have to kind of play and live in and, and realize and keep an open mind that, hey, these markets are always changing. You really have to learn how to listen to the markets or you're going to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, again, this is maybe one of those things where, uh, for some folks, that might mean just sitting out for for a little bit, uh, and 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 that's okay too. You know, if you're, because uh, for me personally, it's hard sometimes with the commodity stocks. Like, I don't know, you know, what what, what am I going to do about the oil stocks? Which one is the winner? I mean, I can go off the technical action, but you know, a lot of these, you know, the earnings are, you know, just turning around and, you know, so you can't really go off these strong numbers or this, this history of consistency in terms of numbers. They're cyclical. They don't have consistency. That's why they're cyclical. Um, <laughs> is there anything that you uh, do on the fundamental side or is this all technical for you in terms of uh, some of these, these cyclical plays and these commodity plays? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to read a little bit for some of these companies, but Really, what I'll, what I'll do more is kind of read more on a macro level of why why mm -hmm. oil is back or why some of these commodities are in demand, uh, kind kind of like the lithium plays or whatever, right? right. Uh, so so you kind of put things together, and then you might then I'll read a a, a bit about the, the companies just to say, okay, why is this a leader? So mm -hmm. I try to do a little bit of it, but that being said, it's just very it's very hard for me to get the kind of the normal conviction. Right. Uh, versus kind of the, the, the traditional growth stocks because of the, those growth stocks, I, I look at it and say, yeah, this could be a, a game changer, right? This could be a service that everyone uses. This is really changing the world versus kind of the commodity stocks. You just know that it's more of a cyclical kind of play, as you said, but that being said, uh, you can also, it's easier to sell those for me, at least, you know, it's like, <laughs> eh, close enough, I made some money on it, I can get out of it. And even if they go up without me, I'm not as upset versus a service that I might actually be using, where it's like, oh my gosh, I used this. And I, why did I get out of it? I, I know that this thing is really amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, again, what it, what it really comes down to kind of just summarize here is, you know, a lot of things that the market feedback is telling you, uh, 
the, that relative strength, which ones are the first ones to get into that new high territory. And um, really it's, uh, you know, sometimes expanding your watch list to those top groups that are maybe not tech related and uh, are, are maybe not in your normal wheelhouse of stocks that you're looking at. So uh, when we come back, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the stocks that are currently on our watch list and go from there. So stay tuned. To help alleviate some of the pain that comes from bear markets, we recommend investing 20 to 25% of the equity portion of your portfolio in a tactical strategy. If you are especially risk averse, we recommend a higher percentage. In 2008, the market declined 37%, yet our portfolio was only down 12%. Why? Because the conditions for investing were poor, so we held a lot of cash. Visit northcoastam.com slash tactical. All investments involve risk, including loss of some or all of an investment. It may not be suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Okay, welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by North Coast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors, the portfolio manager extraordinaire. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about stocks. So let's talk uh, a little bit about this kind of breakouts that aren't working and maybe give some of the warnings out there of uh, stocks that have looked okay, but they don't go for very long before they start rolling over. So. Arusha, anything come to come to your mind? Yeah, oh, we, we we can pull up C Limited here. Okay, uh, and this has been a this has been a great stock over the last few years, and it formed a flat base and broke out, broke out on October eighteenth, and and started to fall through a little bit on October nineteenth. Now the the and the, the bottom is slightly higher than the day before, but still well below. But after a few days, it was finding. Support on the top around 359, but after a few days, it came back in pretty hard, right to the 50-day. Now, mm -hmm. it's still acting fine, right? I mean, it's still normal action. Right. Uh, now, the volume has increased a little bit, but still normal action. There's nothing wrong with the stock, but the problem is, is if you're buying strength, if you're buying breakouts, you're down 5% or probably even more uh, if, if you didn't get it exactly at the pivot. Right. And this is where, um, you know, having one roll over on you like this, no big deal. But when you have stock after stock after stock doing it, then right. it almost right. feels like you're dying this death of a thousand cuts because, yeah, you're keeping your losses small. But if you have a string of losses and any, you know, anyone that's done any gambling theory can tell you it's that string of losses that'll kill you. And, you know, that makes uh, a lot of your, your gambling theory ideas, you know, work good on paper, but not in practice. Um, so one thing I just want to mention is this is, I guess, another reason why these pullbacks, because if you had the early entry on this one, if you were doing this off of a break of a downtrend or the bounce off the 50 day moving average line um, and you had that early entry, well, you know, then maybe you were selling a little bit into the strengths, um, you know, maybe just a portion. And then as it came in, rolled over on you, uh, you, you, you could get out of this at, at flat, you know, instead of taking a, a, a hit to your capital. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, if you're, if you're buying at the support and selling into strength, that I mean, that's clearly the strategy that's worked very, very well this year because it kick it, for all these stocks. It's kept giving you opportunity over and over again to do that, uh, and so you're just rinsing and repeating. Uh, so, so a C limited, you could have kept doing it for, and then rotate over to the energy stocks and keep doing it, right? Yeah, right. So, mm -hmm. so you're if you're taking those quick profits, you've been rewarded this year because the stocks haven't run away. Versus mm -hmm. last year, you if you sold too quickly, those stocks took off and never gave you a chance to get into them for for a while, for a couple of months or so. And well, and we have Charles Harris on next week, and so Charles, this is one of his strengths: <laughs> we're selling into strength, buying at the right. pullbacks over and over. So this is a, a perfect environment for him. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we just look at the weekly chart on SE real quick, um, per C Limited, I mean, this is one that you know certainly had this phenomenal move. So. Is is there any part of this that's a function of oh well you're just late in the rally and you know breakouts are going to fail more as a result? Is there any part of it that you think is due to that? 
Yeah, I, I would think that's reasonable to to think that. Uh, now, may, now I, I guess let's see that that this went sixteen weeks. I mean, that's not it's not like it went sideways long enough to say it reset the base or anything. I mean, the reality is, is even according to the Mark Smith pattern recognition here, it is a stage five. So it's a late stage base just by using the stage count or just by visually looking at it. Yeah, it's right. gone up a lot. <laughs> a lot of people know about it. Mm -hmm. um, it still can work, but the odds of it working as well is less. The other thing that you, you want to keep in mind is if it starts to fail, then, you know, be very, very careful. So there, there are later stage bases that I'll try uh, for comp companies that I really like, but I'm that much quicker to get out of them if they start failing. Yeah. Um, maybe we take a look at AutoNation, ticker symbol AN, on that for just another example of a stock that looked like it was uh, setting up, you know, breaking out to new highs and, you know, looking strong. But, you know, here's another one that looks like it's rolling over right now. Um, now, this this group um, was was one, uh, you know, a group that was getting a lot of attention, seemed like it was it was doing very well, but the group has really uh, fallen lately. Um, so is is that is there something going on with this whole group uh, that's that's kind of leading to this weakness? Or is it just, again, a function of that rotation? It could be a little bit of both, right? It, it uh, th these these stocks, they after they break out, they don't like to go up that much, and they come back in, find support, do the same thing over and over again. So this the automation is pretty disappointing, especially after the earnings reaction. Yeah, the it, it, now it wasn't a super strong reaction, but it was it, it was strong, and you're right at the pivot. Uh, and for the fact the fact that it failed so quickly. That I think in itself, it like, just tells you the environment um, of, of you have to take your profits very quickly when, when you have them. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe we, you know, kind of move over because, again, we're right there in earnings season. Um, snap, you know, the earnings on that, that was kind of big news in the market uh, when that earnings you know, reaction happened. Uh, I mean, it was down 25%. Uh, that's a gap down that, you know, you, you can do anything about it. It's, there's no, there's no, oh, set your stop loss to make sure you don't get hurt. That was just, um, that was just going to hurt no matter what. So are there things that people should have seen or, uh, you know, was there anything that kind of warned you that um, Snap was not the place to be? There weren't any necessarily any clear warnings, though. I, I think the one thing, because I tried Snap a number of times uh, during, especially, you know, a, after the the earnings report for the previous time, it moving up strongly. When you have such a powerful move like that, it was 160 million shares traded that day. It was up 23%, 577% volume. It should have gone higher. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're in a strong environment, if you're in a good trending environment, when a stock does this, it, it has a tendency to trend up pretty well afterwards. Now, if it doesn't, that's telling you something about the environment. Right. So sometimes there sometimes I'll try and I actually did try this one, but there are plenty of other kind of strong earnings type of gaps where I'll just watch them over a few weeks. And if they're struggling, kind of like what Snap started to do. Uh, it, that's telling me about something about the environment. That's like, okay, you want to be a little bit careful about the, the, the strength. Now, that being said, if I really like the company, I'll still try to take it. I'll try it again if it gives me another signal. It broke out of a flat base. I tried it again and then, was, and then quickly got out of it again when it, it didn't start working. So the combination of that whole quarter, it couldn't make any progress. Uh, that was just telling you something was off with it. Mm -hmm. Right. So some funds might have figured out that they were going to struggle. Now, I don't know if anyone really knew that it was going to disappoint this much. Right. It's hard to know exactly what's going to happen before the report. And, and even uh, even harder is it's hard to know the reaction. You could have had the CEO come and tell you, hey, we're going to report these numbers. We're going to disappoint you still don't know, you, you don't know for sure how the reaction is going to be. Right. Sometimes you're in such a strong market that even a disappointment is like, oh, it's not that bad. And the, mar and the stock will actually go up. Right. So, but in this case, this is just a, another, an, another point uh, and another piece of evidence telling you that this market is 
uh, treacherous and you just have to you have to be aware and really manage your risk. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, for a while there, after that gap up on its last earnings report, I was you know, heartened by the fact that it was holding the bulk of those gains, you know, so again, that looked like constructive action to me, it tried to make it to new highs got turned away. But there were a few times where I still, you know, gave it a shot, you know, on these pullbacks. But after they all just, there was just no progress, no progress, the breakout, no progress. Now, it it just was one of those things I, I didn't want to try it again, because I'd already like, you know, said, okay, you know, this has to kind of prove itself again. So I wasn't involved with it. Not that I knew this was coming, um, but sometimes those, you know, early, early warnings of not working make it so that you're not in it when, when something like this happens. So those are some of the warning signs. Oh, mm -hmm. and especially since all these other stocks are moving and working. Yeah, right. Right. And this one's not making progress. If you're, if you're in a correction and this is going sideways, that was a positive, but Mm -hmm. the, the, there are a number of stocks that were trending well and all of a sudden this one wasn't that, that was telling you just from kind of a priority uh, standpoint that Snap was slowly dropping down the list. Like, why am I wasting time when I had these other opportunities of stocks that were actually working? Yeah, and and there's a balancing act, right? You don't want to always constantly be changing lanes, like looking for the faster, you know, faster lane only to have that one stop. But at the same time, you know, at a certain point, if there's an accident in your lane, you you want to move, right? <laughs> you know, you, you you know, and, and again, if if you're if you're sitting there for so long. Um, at a certain point, you just, hey, if, if I want to get home, I'm going to have to move and switch lanes. Uh, let's talk about a few stocks that are uh, looking a little bit stronger. So maybe we can start with Ford. It's got earnings um, out. You know, it looks like earnings are out after the close. Uh, looks like it's having a strong reaction. So this could be a breakout that we see tomorrow. Uh, so by the time this drops, actually, um, we'll see what it looks like. Uh, but I this was one I actually owned uh, myself. I, you know, got this as it was coming up above the 50-day moving average line. Um, I was selling it into strength, and then I, I still held on to a little bit. But it was hard for me to hold this through earnings, especially after what happened in uh, General Motors today, GM. Uh, so I actually got out of this myself. But uh, this is where I'm a little torn. I, I, I'm looking at it. I've got some cushion from that previous trade on it. So I could justify, you know, getting into Ford on a breakout, but we just went through a lot of breakouts that didn't work. So is that where we really want to be? Yeah, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's like you, you can take you, you can uh, you, you can take a shot, you know, and, and manage your risk. Sometimes you get away with it. Sometimes you don't. The, the problem is, is that the odds are right now that there are a number of these failing um, but the, a lot that there are some there are some stocks that when they have these really powerful kind of breakaway gaps on earnings, they are so strong. They they're the one out of four stocks that fight the kind of the general market. Um, so that could be the case here. We're just going to wait and see. That being said, you don't necessarily have to buy it, but put on the watch list and keep an eye on it because it can act as that gauge, letting you know if the market is really. Uh, getting better or not. Yeah. And it certainly is in one of those top groups, uh, auto manufacturers, number 11 out of 197. Of course, uh, we've, we've been seeing a lot of the auto manufacturers, especially those with EV exposure um, doing very well lately. Um, let's go ahead and wrap this up with Enphase, a solar stock. Um, we've been talking about some of the stol- solar stocks looking interesting. Uh, this was kind of the, 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 big, the big mover today with a 25% gap up uh, or gain after after its gap up today. So this one might be uh, might be out of there, but how would you view this? Are you going to wait for a pullback? Are you going to wait for it to hold? Um, are you going to look at other uh, stocks in the space? Uh, I'm going to watch this one closely uh, because it, it, that is such a powerful move, right? So it is up 25%. 727% above average volume. Today, it traded 15 million shares, which towers over the volume this whole year, except the, the 33 million shares. Um, so ideally, you know, the, 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 the best thing it could do is go sideways for a few days, consolidate that, and then start moving higher. Um, but there are some times where they just really take off. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to keep a close eye on it. Uh, this is one that I will consider if it kind of settles down uh, because it's such a strong move. It's in a growth area. 
good numbers. Uh, and, and so they have a lot of things going for it. So if the environment truly is good and we're in a trending environment, this is one that should work. And I should just uh, disclose that I do have a position in TAN, which is the Invesco Solar ETF. So um, I guess by proxy, I probably have a, a position in Enphase because uh, that's that's one of the components of TAN. Um, now, Justin, but, I'll say one more thing. It should work, right? And say I try, say I end up we're gonna trying to say the fact it, that I'm in it, it won't. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, yeah, no, I'm just no, wondering no, if you're going to be that mean. <laughs> no, not, not, not right now. But, uh, but uh, well, if say, say I try, I tried over the next week or so. Look, if, if, if I'm down that five to 8%, I'm out, right? Yeah. So it's, even though it should work and what I think it should work, there, there are plenty of times where they don't work. And mm -hmm. so when it doesn't work, cut your losses. That's the one thing that you truly have control over. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is something that I mentioned on IBD Live because someone was talking about, you know, David Ryan and maybe a, a stock that he had that didn't work. And it's like, hey, look, David Ryan's wrong all the time. I'm wrong all the time. We're all wrong all the time. I saw Bill, one of his best years ever was in 98, 99. He had more losing trades than winning trades. Wow. But his winners were like AOL and Schwab, you know, where he was up 400% in six months. So, you know, that he was taking some small losses sometimes in order to put more money into those, those big winners. And so again, it's, um, you know, I don't, I don't care who the person is. Everyone is, you know, every trader is going to be wrong. Um, you know, probably a lot, but it's a matter of that risk management. That's what it comes down to. And that's one of the things we were talking a lot about with Mark Minervini when he was on our podcast, not too long ago. And also when he was on IBD live today, you know, it's, it's kind of that same thing with poker, right? Um, you know, everyone's got the same chances at, you know, good cards, but how they handle it. Uh, that's why you see the same, the same champions at the last, uh, the, the final table year after year. So, um, okay, well, that'll do it for uh, this week. Thank you so much for watching and listening if, you, if that's what you were doing. Uh, next week, we have Charles Harris, Portfolio Manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. So we'll have two portfolio managers from O'Neill Global Advisors on the show, Arusha and Charles, uh, talking about how they're viewing the market and what stocks are on their radar. And I'm hoping we get a lot of good lessons from Charles because he's uh, had a lot of success in the last year or so. Um, well, actually, the last decades, <laughs> last few decades. So that'll be fun to chat with Charles. I uh, hope you join us for that next week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.